Revelation chapter number 9. You'll recall last week the fifth angel had sounded his trumpet. And we read the majority of this chapter last week. But we ended, verse number 12, one woe is past, and behold, there come two more woes hereafter. And if you'll remember, the three woes, being the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet that come after those trumpets, they were said to be far worse than the ones that came before it. And you will remember, last week we talked about those locusts that had the tails as scorpions. The Bible said that it was given to them power to cause pain and torment to men for five months. So for five months, every man on the face of the earth, man, woman, boy, child, doesn't matter what age, for five months they have been in such agony that in your Bible they cry out for death, but death does not come. The Bible says the agony as of a scorpion. If you get a scorpion bite, you are immobilized. It's not like a pain that you can, you know, bite the bullet and get back to work. Right? This is debilitating pain. The pain that everyone fears. Pain so strong that all you can think about is pain. And they don't even have the hope of death taking away the pain. Now, if they were students of the Bible, they might know it's going to last five months. But for many of them, they're just going to be in pain with no end in sight for that pain. And then after five months, another trumpet sounds. And the pain goes away. They think that the end of their troubles has finally come. After five months of excruciating pain, they came out the other side of it and they're okay. They didn't die. Well, verse number 13 of chapter number 9, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth, and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire, and smoke, and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone, which is issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men, which were not killed by these plagues yet, repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor their sorceries, nor their fornication, nor of their thefts. So can you imagine, after five months of excruciating pain, the pain is finally taken away, and you look up on the horizon, and there's an army coming to mow you down. We told you with the first four horns... God's judgment was to prove that man's intellect cannot think of a way out of coming face to face with the wrath of God. He took away all of the options that the Antichrist could have had. We gave you a few, few examples of how they might be able to replenish the grass of the earth after God sent fire from heaven to destroy it all. But every plan that the Antichrist has, God proves that you cannot escape the judgment of God. Then the fifth trumpet sounds, 
and God delivers unto them a injury that they cannot find a cure for. And now we have the sixth horn has sounded. We have an army that you cannot escape from. You cannot defend against this army. You cannot erect strong walls to keep these guys out. They were made for one reason and one reason alone, these four angels. Now let's start, if you will. Okay, the sixth trumpet sounds. And then in verse number 14, there's a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. That's God's altar. That altar was the one that God used to give the blueprint to Moses when he led Israel out of Egypt on what the altar here on earth was supposed to look like because it was supposed to resemble that one. Likewise, that mercy seat that Israel had was likened unto the mercy seat that was in heaven. In Old Testament terminology, what God basically said was if you are faithful to use the instruments that I've given you detailed instructions on how to craft and what they should look like, modern day terminology was that was a fax machine. God would see what was on the altar down here and he would accept it as a facsimile in heaven because they offered it up on the instruments that God had given him. Did it take away their sin? No. It pushed it back for a year. But it was a finger pointing toward the future where one day God would provide a lamb that would take away our sin. That's the only blood that's ever been on the mercy seat in heaven. That's the only sacrifice that God ever offered up on the altar in heaven. But when it says that a voice is coming out of the altar, you know who's talking? God. That's God's altar. It's got horns on that altar. Guess who's speaking out of that horn? God is. It says there was a voice. It came out of the altar. And it said unto the angel that blew the sixth trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Now nowadays, we think of the river Euphrates being that one that's over there in Iraq. Right, one of the two major of, you know, the original Mesopotamian culture that they think we all came from. The other one's called the Tigris. But, and very well, that may be the river that God's talking about. That may be the one that He says, "I've got four angels tied up down there in the river Euphrates, going to loose them." But. If you go back to the book of Genesis, you'll find that there were four rivers in the Garden of Eden. One of them was called the Euphrates. Where's that river at? Now, I don't know, Brother Ron, because God sent this thing called the flood, and He turned the world, all the dirt on top of this thing that we call the world, and He turned it all topsy turvy. If you want proof, you can go to the Great or the Grand Canyon. And there's a thing called the great unconformity. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. If you go down deep enough, there's a gap between bedrock and then sediment rock that's on top of it. The width isn't uniform, but there's a sign of the fact that somebody scooped everything above that off of it and then turned it all on top of itself. But if you go to the Grand Canyon, you can see all the different layers of the strata of where God took dirt from here and threw it down. And God took dirt from here and put it on top of it. Well, if God did that during the flood, that river Euphrates, the original one, it's hidden. It was taken away. But I believe, and I've already said it could be that he is talking about the river Euphrates over in the rock. But I believe that somewhere layered in the crust of this old earth where it used to a river used to flow God's got four angels that he's had in exile for I don't know how long I believe he put them there back when he made the Garden of Eden 
because he knew that the day was coming when they would be needed. Was not Jesus the lamb slain before the foundation of the world? Do you not think that God knew what the end was going to be before he even made the beginning? And somewhere an angel is going to come down with a key, much like the fifth horn that we had already heard sound, where they took the lid off of the bottomless pit. There's another pit somewhere where used to a river named Euphrates used to flow. And there's four angels in there that have one job. You'll find that a lot with the Lord. It doesn't say that these angels are ones that came down with Lucifer and rebelled against them. They may be. But God in the very alpha of time made these four angels to do one thing. And they're getting ready to do it. The only thing that has kept these four angels from fulfilling what God made them to do was the will of God. If you want to, go to the first chapter of the book of Job, second chapter, third chapter, you're going to find that Satan himself, unless God permits it, can't do a thing. And when God made these angels, he said, I'm going to put you somewhere where you can't get out until I say so. But when I say so, you're going to bring my wrath and my judgment upon the earth and you're going to kill a third of the men that are living. We don't know how long this takes. In fact, we don't even know how many humans are left at this point. We know at the beginning of the seven years that it's going to be the population of earth minus however many are raptured out of here. But I also know that much death has already come up to this point. I know that the Antichrist and his crowd are going to slay a great number. The Bible says it's a number that comes out of every kindred and nation and tongue and people. And it's a number that no man can number. But he just numbered a pretty big number here in verse number 16. He said we're 200,000 thousand. You know what a thousand times 200,000 is? 200 million. That's how big this army is going to be. Well, they were able to number that number, so how many's coming from the Great Tribulation to get them white robes because they resisted the Antichrist? I don't know, but it's got to be bigger than that because they numbered that. But I do know that however many are left, an army of 200 million has never been seen on the face of the earth. Even if you mustered an army of 200 million people in today, not all of them going to be on the front line. Man fights in a top-down format. There's always somebody higher up the chain that's telling you what to do. Most of the time, that person isn't right next to you in the trenches. That is not how this army operates. The four angels that are put in charge of this army they thoroughly know what it is that God wants them to do and they're thoroughly equipped to do it. And the army that they command that rides out against mankind, they have one purpose, and that's to kill a third of the people that are alive. They know how to do it. They've got the tools to do it. There's no tent of people many miles away from where the fighting's happening giving orders, everybody's all in and they're all fighting at once. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I know that these things are supernatural. They don't move like men move. They don't run like men run. The horses that they're riding, right, do not run like the horses we know. They're moving a whole lot quicker than the Kentucky Derby. I can promise you that. And you can tell by the instruments that they use, you don't have to hang around and slay each and every person with a sword. The tools that they're using are meant to be shocking all tactics. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? Well, we already gave you the number of them in verse number 16, but in verse number 17 it says, Then I saw the horses in division. 
and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth. Now, this hellish army that's been, because that's where I believe this army's coming from, God took the lid off of hell, and now these four angels are going and stirring up the ones in hell that can come out and do this job. I may be wrong on that, but that makes sense to me. But that's probably why it's wrong, because it makes sense. We're talking about prophecy. But wherever these horsemen and these horses come from, it says that they have breastplates of fire and of Jason. Now, isn't it just like the devil to try and imitate the things of God? You remember in the previous part of this chapter when we were talking about them locusts that it said that the, each one of them was given a crown and that their king the one named Apollyon right Satan was the one giving them orders and we said that he gave all of his servants crowns because they think they're getting ready to take over and they're going to have power forever and ever right they're false crowns but he gives them crowns why? Because Jesus promised that he'd make you a king and a priest, so the devil had to make the same promise. So if the locusts were his kings with the crowns, the guys on the backs of these horses, they have breastplates of fire and of Jason. Well, if you study it out, I'm not going to make you turn there. But that stone, Jason, you're going to find it referenced in Exodus chapter number 28, verse number 19 under a different name it's called a leisure l-i-g-u-r-e it's the same stone it's a reddish orange stone depending on the color sometimes it can almost look purple but if the locusts were his kings I believe that these men are considered to be his priests you say why do you say that because when God used it and last instructed God's people to use it it was put into the breastplate of the high priest. What's the devil's M.O.? The devil's M.O. is to take the things of God, corrupt them, pervert them, make them his own. Well, just as he gave crowns to all of the locusts that came out of the smoke that rose up from the bottomless pit, here are these horses, these 200 million riders, they have breastplates of fire and Jason. Why? Because the devil's given these individuals the power to what? To literally ride on horses that have fire and smoke and brimstone coming out of their mouth, and they got tails of snakes. And he's saying, These are my chosen. My chosen, in a breath, literally can wipe out a third of the people on the face of the earth. Well, it goes on to say that their, breast, their breastplates right, were a fire and of Jason's. I also believe that that is to symbolize no matter where you are, if light hits a Jason's stone, it's going to pop. There's very few things in nature that have that tint. It's an unnatural, well, it's an unusual tint, not an unnatural one. But it also says that that breastplate is a fire, meaning it's got its own light within it. No matter where you are, you can see doom coming on the horizon. It is a warning sign, not like a lighthouse, where it says, turn away and you'll find safety. Here it's saying, damnation's coming to find you. Well, it says, the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. You mean that that horse literally has a lion's head? Maybe. People have been trying to copy this for thousands of years. They usually call it a chimera. It's got the head of a lion, tail of a snake. Sometimes it's got the head of a griffin, the body of a lion. But it's a mishmash of animals. I don't believe that what's coming out is a piece of this and a piece of that and a piece of this. Again, I believe that the Apostle John's trying to give us the best that he can. 
with what he's limited to. I think he's never seen anything like the animals that these things come riding out on. But he says they have heads as lions. Well, lions got big mouths. You ever seen a lion open its mouth all the way and yawn? And you're thinking, oh yeah, there's easily no problem that thing could swallow me whole, right? But a lion also has a mane. I believe that part of the head of this animal is to signify that it's the tippy top of the food pyramid when it comes to the perversions and the creations of hell. You look at a, a lion, it don't do much if it's a male lion. But in fact, male lions kind of lazy. They take a lot of naps. You know why they can take a lot of naps? Because they know nothing's out there hunting them. Because they're the top of the, they're the king of the jungle. They roar and everything else runs away. In fact, in order to hunt, the female lions have to get so quiet that you don't even know they're there. That's how scary lions are. But the head of this thing, you have no second guesses about, oh, I think that might be a nice horse. No. The head of this thing is all business, and it's letting you know that it's the top of the food pyramid. You stand no chance. Well, then it says, they had the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Now they say, I don't know, but they say the brimstone smells of a sulfur scent. Rotten eggs magnified many times over. But in truth, man does not know what brimstone is. Just like man does not know what wormwood is. You remember that from a few lessons ago. We know that it's bitter. But where does it come? It comes from God. God took it and flung it out of the sky down to earth. Now brimstone, we know that God pours out fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. Brimstone is not just something of a scent. It is something of destruction. But after that destruction is wrought, that's where that sulfur and that rotten egg smell comes from. Brimstone isn't just a rock. Brimstone is a sign of God's divine punishment and destruction. But if you will, equate brimstone to the nukes of God's, man of, or, or, you know, God's armory. You throw it out and all it does is bring destruction. Never has been, never will be a nuclear missile that's ever dropped that builds something. They are made for destruction. They are made for eradication. That is true of brimstone. Now this smoke, we know that smoke will kill you before fire will. Some people are going to be lucky because long before these suckers ever show up to where they're at, the smoke gets to them first. But then it says fire. In fact, one of my, he's not here, so I'll tell this. Brother Phil, one time, Dad was preaching on there's a lot of bad ways to die. Right? Drowning would be awful. Suffocating, but then being underwater. Every breath you take is just water. Well, likewise, fire, pretty bad. And then Brother Phil said, you know, Dad's like, there's a lot of ways to die. You know, I just wish a shark would come up in the water and eat me. And then Brother Phil said, yeah, or a dinosaur. <laughs> so Brother Phil still thinks dinosaurs are walking around, but... But no, none of these deaths are painless. Y'all ever been swimming and you start running out of air and your head starts panicking saying, hey, get up there, get up there, we need air? No one in this room has ever experienced the sensation of knowing that you're going to die because you can't take another breath. The people that are killed by smoke will. That's an excruciating way to go. They tell me that when someone is gasping for air, that all the muscles in your body are trying to help your lungs out. That the blood vessels in your eyes literally burst. 
because your body's trying to suck in air so hard. And all they get is more smoke that came out of hell. That's not normal smoke. That's the smoke that comes off of God's judgment. Is not hell a place of torment that was originally reserved for the devil and his angels? That smoke that's supposed to make angels be in pain when they breathe it. And I will remind you that angels are bad dudes. Two of them destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities of the plain with no problem. One of them went down and whooped an entire army in the night. One flew over Egypt and the firstborn of every household, livestock, animal, everything. Gone in an instant. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? If that smoke was meant to inflict pain and torment upon angels, how much worse do you think it would be for us that we're made a little lower than the angels? And it says that a third of those that are killed, so one-ninth of the population is killed by that smoke. One-ninth is killed by that brimstone that proceeds out of the mouth of these lions. One-third is killed by the fire. But then, I find this interesting. Verse number 19 says, For their power is in their mouth. Well, that's obvious. They just killed a third of the population with the things that came out of their mouth. But then the Apostle John says, And in their tails. Now, it doesn't say that their tails kill anything. But he says they have powers in their tail. They got power in their mouth, power in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents, and had heads, and with them they do hurt. You've got unstoppable, unavoidable destruction in the front of this horse. You know that there's no getting away from it, or I mean outrunning it. So just in case you had the thought that you were going to try and sneak around behind it and get away, there's no escape. If this thing wants you dead, you're dead no matter where you go. You can't hide behind a rock and then pop out after it's run by because it's got tails that'll bite you. What's it say? It says that they do hurt. It doesn't say that they kill. But if you got bit by a rattler or a cobra or a mamba or even an anaconda, if it wasn't venomous, you give it enough time, it may not be instant, but eventually you're going to be immobilized. And after you've accepted the fact that you can't go anywhere, what happens? This thing's coming to get you. Why does it have to have tails just in case somebody thought they could sneak around it? If this thing's coming for you, you can't get away. And a third of the population is going to be snuffed out. How long, Brother Jordan? I don't know. No, the last one, there was an agony for five months. How long is it going to take these suckers to run across the world? I don't know. But in all of it, the two-thirds of what's left Right, because we've already seen the other plagues where a whole bunch of people died. The other judgments of God that were poured out. Not to mention all the ones that were martyred because they wouldn't sign up with the Antichrist, but the two-thirds of whatever was left to start with. In the face of something that they know they can't conquer. They can't kill it. You don't think that there's going to be some redneck somewhere that sees this thing coming and unloads everything he's got in his arsenal at it? He's not going to be able to stop it. Then after reports get around that, hey, there's nothing we can do to him. We flew an F-22 at it and dropped a giant bomb on it and it laughed at us. Right? It shot fire back at the jet and knocked it out of the sky. Right? We sent in seal team whatever after it and tried to sneak up behind it 
and its tail bit them like a snake. They're dead. It killed them with smoke. They know there's nothing that they can do to escape what's coming. The only reason these things don't kill all of them is because God put a limit on it at one third. But knowing that there's nothing they can do to stop these things, they can't sweet talk their way out of these things, they can't find common ground with these things, they can't find a common enemy with these things. They just know that these things are destruction incarnate. The end of the chapter tells us, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands. I believe this verse is testament of the fact of how if a man is righteous in his own eyes, the only thing that can humble him would be the work of the Holy Ghost. You can look back. I, we've already referenced it, but when God led His people out of Egypt, it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Until what? Until it broke. You can only get so hard until the only way to get any more pressure on it is for it to snap. Everybody's got a breaking point. But left to man's own devices, as a man thinketh, so is he. If you think that you're right, in your mind, you're right. And even though God has opened the very pit of hell with the fifth trumpet, even though in this trumpet things are coming out of hell that man could have never envisioned. And bringing all kinds of destruction to the world. They've just been immobilized for five months, Brother Ron, not able to do anything in excruciating pain. And then when they are able to get up and run, the things that are chasing them can't be stopped. And nowhere in that thought process does the two-thirds that are left think, you know what, maybe we were wrong. Maybe the Antichrist doesn't have all the answers here. He promised everything was going to be good, and it was for about three and a half years. But it's not good anymore. Not one, the Bible says, repents of the works of their hands. Now, shortly, you'll remember back with the seven seals, after the sixth seal was opened, there was a bit of an intermission before we got to the seventh seal. Well, here six trumpets have sounded, there's one left, but then in chapter number 10, we get another little intermission. The Apostle John says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with the cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Let's just stop here. There's a lot of speculation on who that angel is or what it is. I believe Jesus knows what Jesus, or I believe that John knows what Jesus looks like. And this thing comes back and puts one land, or one foot on the land, one foot on the sea. If it were Jesus, that'd be his second coming, because he came back to earth. It's not Jesus, because the second coming happens later on in this book. All I know is, it's not Jesus. But, verse number two, had a, and he had in his hand a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are there, and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is in the open hand 
which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went to the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Now we know that an angel is dispatched from heaven. Notice how he is arrayed. The angel, by definition, angel means a messenger from God. It means someone's on the master's business. In the beginning of this book, we find that John was told to write to the seven angels of the seven churches. Who was that? God's messenger to those churches, the pastors. Well, this angel, this messenger, is clothed with the cloud. Who but God can make clothing out of clouds? It testifies to where he came from. He didn't come from the bottomless pit. He came from on high. He's got a different origin. It doesn't say that he's clothed with smoke. It says he's clothed with the cloud. Is not a cloud associated with God's presence with God's people in the wilderness? This man is, or this angel is descended, and it's undisputable where he comes from by what he's wearing. It says, and a rainbow was upon his head. I believe this symbolizes that God keeps God's promises. He made a covenant with the first rainbow that said he'd never destroy the earth again by water. I believe that God just made a promise a few chapters ago that he's getting ready to fulfill. A rainbow is a testament to the fact that God, if he promises it, he keeps it. And this angel says, God remembers what he's promised to do. Then it says, and his face was as it were the sun. Keep in mind, a lot of darkness with the seven trumpets and the seven seals being open. The earth hadn't seen light in a while. So again, to identify him with the one who is light. His face, he doesn't care what he looks like. He just wants to give off the impression of what? That God sent him. The angel has no identity, but you know that his face is as it were the sun. Why? Because he's been real close to God. Did not Moses' face shine when he came down off the mountain after talking with the burning bush? Well, it says in his feet as pillars of fire. Again, a symbol that God has all control over destruction. And even though fire has come and brought much destruction to the earth lately, here God took a thing that is meant to destroy and yet it's supporting and holding up this angel. Just testament to the fact that God can take anything and make all things work together for them that love him. But it says, and he had in his hand a little book. What do you think's in that little book, Brother Jordan? I believe that what's in that little book that John ate up and made a part of himself was what he's writing about. Is what that he went and preached about. It is the revelation of God that God wanted preached unto all people and to all nations. Because that's what he told them to do with it at the end of the book. I believe that the book were the things that he was permitted to write. Because we just heard that when this angel lifts his hand up to heaven and cries with a loud voice that seven thunders answer. But John wasn't allowed to write down what those seven thunders said. I believe that book is what God authorized him. It says it's a little book. In comparison, the book of Revelation is real small compared to the rest of the Bible. I believe John saw a whole lot that if he put pen to paper, he could have wrote for the rest of his life and still never 
expounded all that he saw and what God showed him. But God gave him a little book to write. I mean, can you imagine? Seeing, it said that Jesus in three and a half years in his earthly ministry, if everything was written and recorded that he did, the earth couldn't contain it. Imagine seeing all the things that God's going to do for all of eternity. Can you imagine writing them things down? So what's he get? He gets a little book. And this angel cries. Says he swears. In other words, he promises. He makes an oath. Unbreakable. And who does he make this promise by? By God himself. It says, By him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven, the things that are therein, and the earth, and the things that are that therein are, and then the sea, and the things that are therein, that there should be time no longer. God stops the clock. Now, go back just a little bit to them seals. I believe it was, it was either the fourth or the fifth that God, Jesus opens that seal and all those martyrs that have been killed from the great tribulation, they say, Lord, how long until we're avenged? And God replied, just a little time. A little while longer. Because there's some that still need to get in. He says, we're not shutting the door to the ark until everybody's on board. Well, this angel comes and he says, there's time no longer. Meaning what? Time's run out for everybody on earth. But I also believe that God literally stops time. Everything that's been moving since the beginning of creation and spinning, things that have been revolving around other things, I believe God stops it all on a dime. He says, no more time. You know how that wristwatch that people used to wear works and nowadays the clock on your phone works? It's because man measured out down to as precise as they can how long it takes the earth to go around the sun in one day. Or I mean in one year. They've measured how long it takes for the earth to rotate on its axis for one day. And they've mapped it out that a day can be broken down into 24 equal increments of one hour. And one hour is an equal segment of time equal to 60 minutes. And 60 minutes equals 36 or 360 seconds. And they've done all that based off of what? The way that time in God's creation works. Because when God made it all, it had order to it. And God says, I'm taking away the very ability for you to tell what time of day it is. No more time. Time's run out. You had all the time in the world to get right with God, and God just stopped the clock. In other words, it reads zero, 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 zero. No more time. Then it says that John went to the angel with the little book. He said, give it to me. He said, take it, eat it up. He said, it'll be bitter in your belly and sweet in your mouth. John ate it, and he testifies to the fact that it was sweet in his mouth, but it was bitter in his belly. This book that he ate up, that he had to go preach, that he had to record, that he had to go testify to the rest of the world of what was going to happen, it was sweet to the taste. Because the end result of this story is that God finishes what he started. That our salvation will be realized. That we will forevermore be with God, never to be separated again. That we will forever have fellowship with our Creator for all eternity. That's a pretty sweet ending. But he says, but it was also bitter in his belly. Although he enjoyed thinking about, and it was sweet to think about the end of the book, he had a burden that was bitter that he had to go preach. What was that burden? That as sweet as the ending is, there's going to be a lot that suffered damnation. And John is filled with a Holy Ghost burden to go and preach to those 
that they may or that they don't have to be one of those that goes through the tribulation. He's filled with a purpose to prepare Christians so that they live every day like it is the last day. Because he knows one day time's going to run out. God's going to stop the clock. We know that man's days are numbered. Every man has a number on his head that God's given him. And that unless God changes that number, it ain't changing. But John now has just realized and fully understands. He knew that Jesus was coming back because he was there when he saw him going to heaven. And the angel said, you'll see him come again in like manner. He's coming back one day. John's lived every day. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. He knew Jesus was alive. He was talking with him. Then he gets called up to the third heaven and he sees, John, this is how things are going to end. And it's sweet as the ending that he's seen is going to be. He's also filled with a burden and conviction to go and preach to those that haven't received the Lord so that they might be a part of that crowd that's viewing these events from heaven's viewpoint. Not from the earth's viewpoint. And the angel said unto John in verse number 11, Thou must prophesy again. Prophesy. That's just a fancy word for preaching. But literally, he's giving them prophecy while he's preaching. He says, You've got to go preach again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Even this morning, because of the preservation of God's word through an act of God John today still prophesies of what's in that little book every time somebody opens the book of Revelation and reads what's therein many peoples, many nations many tongues, many kings have all heard what John ate in that little book but I believe also while he was still alive he was the only apostle to die of a natural death. But I believe while he was still alive, he preached to many nations, many tongues, many peoples, many kings even. We know that the apostle Paul preached to almost all the court of Caesar himself. We know that recorded that some of Caesar's household even saluted the saints. Why? Because they got saved. What happened? God said, I'm going to open doors and this is the message that you're going to preach to them when you walk through it. You know what the sad commentary is? Many have read this book. Many have consumed it as Christians, but yet they only focus on what is sweet in their mouth. They care not for the bitterness in the belly. Makes you uncomfortable. Especially, I, I got a hard time shouting about eternity, Brother Adrian. Because, yeah, I'm happy about streets of gold and a mansion. I'm over the moon about him sitting in his throne and the saints gathered around by the crystal sea. But at the same time, if I wrap my head around how long eternity is, which I can't do, but every now and then I think I'm getting close, and you know what it does? It scares the living daylights out of this flesh. Because his flesh knows it's going back to the ground. It fills my stomach with dread. Because I know for me to have eternity and all the joys that come with it, there will be those that will be in the lake of fire. You can't truly shout and appreciate what God's going to give you in glory until you see what's on the other side. And John says it was bitter in his belly. How sweet was it? It kept him going until the end. It was sweet enough that it gave him a glimpse that he was able to finish. I believe if God truly showed us what it was like in heaven that every Christian would commit suicide just to be there. How sweet is the book of Revelation? Sweet enough to get you to the finish line. To know that you're a winner either way. 
to know that when it's all paid out, everything that God has said is going to come true. But it also ought to fill your belly with bitterness and a burden to go out and tell those around you, hey, there's coming a day when the clock's going to stop. There's coming a day when a final horn is going to be sounded and a trumpet from heaven is going to be uttered and this angel swears by the one that's in glory that created everything that in the days, verse number 7, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared it to his servants and prophets. Everything that God threw dim mirrors and we look through a glass dimly Right, trying to look at a lamp behind a dingy piece of glass. We just get glimpses of it. He's saying, when this seven angel starts to sound, it's all going to become true. God's going to finish what He promised and finish what He prophesied to all of His prophets. And God's going to make it not just real, but inescapable. And He tells John, go and tell him that one day a seventh angel is going to sound. And God's wrath and destruction will finally be pulled, poured out upon the earth. The time for long-suffering and mercy and grace will be gone. And they'll have to face the righteous and the holy judgment of a thrice holy God. That's the message that filled him, his belly with bitterness. Because he knew that whatever was coming was going to be worse than everything he had already seen. And he knew that there were going to be real people with real souls that have real hearts that beat flesh and blood that were going to have to endure it. And they don't have to. They only did it because they chose to. So he wanted to go give people a choice. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.